Good evening, friends. So I've got a tale, one very special tale. This one is, uh, it's quite beloved. The problem is it's quite a long tale. So bear with me because tonight is about that long tale. And it begins in the Greek Isles. Now, very specifically, it starts on Crete. For those of you that might know, Greece kind of looks like this, and Crete is just a, underneath it. And now these people, they're not always Greek. Just kind of depends on when you go, whether they're the Cretans themselves or whether they're proud Grecians. For the sake of this tale, these were people who believed in the gods because this was a time way back when there were so many. They had the great Olympians, but then a great subset, uh, several others. Every god had aspects. All of them were plain in the lives of the mortals. I mean, in this case, indeed, they played with the lives of two mortals. And very specifically, that of dear Irene. Now, Irene was a beautiful shepherd's daughter. She did what she could about the house, learned how to weave and how to fix things, and how to cook so she could aid her mother. She also learned how to tend the sheep to aid her father. That being said, she had a wee bit of an adventurous side as well. Her parents understood that quite well, and even quite young, they allowed her to venture out as long as there was one rule that was met. And as long as she kept to that, she was allowed to wander as she pleased. She was to return home before the last rays of sun fell beneath the horizon. Certainly enough, she had never run into a problem with that, as many times as she'd ventured quite far out, she always knew how quickly to get back home. And such was the case, as so one day, all her chores being done, a fine young woman in her own right, Irene stepped out into the woods and found herself this most unusual path that she had never seen before. It was lovely, it might have been a deer path, there were these beautiful yellow flowers. Now, yellow was the color of her mother's heart. Indeed, it was her very favorite color. And so she thought to herself that she would pick a bouquet of these, perhaps, and, and take them back to her mother. While she was following along, she got, she got rather distracted and, and just enjoyed the path until she came to a beautiful clearing. The trees had grown so tall here. The highest canopy was so, so above her head. There were beautiful little peaks of sunlight streaming in. She could hear in the distance just the soft babble of a brook. And the yellow flowers were all over across the ground. But there was something else that she could hear. There was a slight bit of music. And when she looked into this very near distance, there was a cave. And on the entrance to a cave. So being a bit curious and perhaps lacking that uh, self-preservation aspect, she crept forward and looked into the cave. Now, at this point, she stopped dead in her tracks because at this point she knew that she was in potential danger. You see, the Greeks, they believed that the gods, as great and mighty and wonderful and multifaceted as they were, would walk amongst the humans. Indeed, their stories of their heroes were not so far removed as you might expect, treated them more like uh, our kings, our queens. And so, when she saw a man, long, beautiful, dark hair, sitting on a rock and playing a pan flute, she had a moment to worry. But in this moment's pause, as she hesitated at the entrance of the cave, <laughs> the machinations of the gods started to play. 
in fact, the great goddess Aphrodite, the goddess of love, sent forth a great mighty wind so that our dear Irini stumbled forward just a moment. And that stumble kicked a few rocks at her feet. And those rocks alerted the man to her presence. When he looked up at her, she had a moment. Well, <laughs> she had a moment of thinking, of course, that it could be Apollo, or it could be Pan, or she could just be in trouble entirely, and she didn't want to put a name to it. But my goodness, those dark eyes and the way that they looked up at her. She felt something she'd never felt before. Those little stirrings made her brave, so that when the man called up to her, Hello? She didn't run away. In fact, she stood her ground and, and cocked her head. Just a moment. H Hello? The man seemed to catch himself, and stretching his legs out, looked up at her again. He's, Are you not a trick of some sort? immortal being, mortal being, either way, this didn't quite go with what Irini had expected him to say. But instead she kind of paused and, and looked back at him. Hey, I'm not a trick. At this point the man set his flute down and looked up at her and said, then go, you must go now. A moment of confession here, my dear friends. See, um, I know that I personally do not like being told what to do. Uh, let a character seasoning, if you will. Some might call it a character flaw, but uh, Irene had the same um, seasoning. She didn't uh, like quite to be told what to do. She just, it was not her favourite thing. So sure enough, she stood her ground and asked, well, why should I have to go? I've only just arrived. And the man with pleading eyes looked at her again. He's, you don't understand. See, there's a great old crone who holds me captive here. And you have to go before she returns. <laughs> and Rainey, she... Uh, she didn't care enough to, to quite be afraid at this point. Just a wee bit naive. She thought to herself that there's nothing a crone could do to her that she was scared of. So sure enough, she looked at him and noticed that indeed he was held captive. Around his ankles was a great vine. This was unusual, but surely she could break through this. So she took her little hunting knife that she always had with her, knelt down and took a simple cut. Well, that should have been the end of it in her mind, until the vine started to grow back just as it was cut. Only this time with great jagged black thorns, these great thorns started to cut into the man's ankles. This is the moment when Irene finally realized she was not just dealing with a crone, rather a wicked witch. Now, of course, I, I do like to point out that there are many types of witches. There are those that practice for good, and those that practice something that's not quite good or bad. But there are certain magics that are not meant for good that are very specifically against the forces of good. And when you hold someone captive against their will, it's not usually a good sign. Well, <laughs> at this point, Irene knows she's out of her depth. However, she also knows from the angle of the sunlight when she entered the cave, she does not have quite that much time left. So she sheathes her knife, and she kneels at the foot of the man and she says, I will find a way to come and save you. I will, I shall, I promise. 
man smiles, hoping this is of course not a fool's errand. And he asks her, well, then I shall know the name of my saviour. She admits, my name is Irini. And smiles even, even wider. Well, that's indeed my very favourite name. Now, let me explain something to you here. Irini actually means something along the lines of good and kind and honourable. It's, it's not unlike a Greek equivalent to the name Bonnie in Scots. And, well, I mean, in this case, Irini was quite a fitting name. Just as Bonnie might be a fitting name. I mean, perhaps. But indeed, Irini was <laughs> stirred by this. And she smiled and responded, Well, sir, I don't have yours. And he took a moment's pause before telling her, Just beat on. I am beat on. And she, of course, took that name, beat on, and took it with her all the way home. Well, that night, she, of course, prayed to the great Aphrodite asking that she might find the path again and find the will to continue and that she might find the end of this quest in the name of love for which this surely must be what it was was love it's the only thing that could quite explain the stirrings in her heart and the call to action she felt the next day, first thing in the morning, she got straight through her chores and went down that path. She wasn't quite certain what she would do, but she knew that she would find a way to clear away all the thorns and, and save him. As she gets to the clearing with, with no problem whatsoever, it's almost as if the path is laid out in front of her intentionally. She gets to the cave and she hears the pan flute swelling and it sounds a bit hopeful even. Then she gets in the cave and there's a little bit of a wrinkle. You see, in place of the vines from the previous day, there were you now iron shackles. Iron isn't quite as easy to cut through or really release at all so she was unsure what to do so she she thought i am a pious girl i shall pray and she thought to herself about who she might pray to and, and well aphrodite had clearly answered her prayers something told her that she should pray instead to hera now, hera being the goddess of mothers and marriage made a bit of sense. That being said, those of you who may or may not know your mythology, Hera's a bit of, um, she's not want to answer her suppliants in a positive manner, commonly, especially not any new suppliants or, or ones who were not yet mothers or not yet wed, but between the way that our dear Irini had always been the best of daughters to her mother. And the future that was laid out before our dear, dear heroine. Hera acquiesced that day. And she set down a rainbow. Now, many of you may know that Hermes is the messenger god. But Hera preferred to use Iris, the rainbow goddess, for all of her messages. Well, looking out of the cave and seeing that rainbow sparkling, well, Irini knew she had been her. And for whatever reason, she took up her knife again. Just again, a very simple hunting knife. And she went about, cut right through the manacles, almost as if they were butter. Now, Beton stood. He stretched as perhaps he'd not stretched in months. And he went to put his arms around Irini to thank her. When from the back of the cave, there started a loud rumbling noise. 
almost like thunder at first. And then it enveloped the two of them almost in a growling, rasping racket. This point, Beton, a panicked look on his face, pushes Irini out and he says, Go, you must go now. Uh, Irini doesn't like being told what to do, but she knows by the tone of his voice that something is wrong. It is very wrong. So she runs all the way home. She's not certain what has happened, but she knows that she has to get home and she has to be safe. And so that night she prays again and she prays. And she thanks Hera for her help and hopes that she continues to help. And the very next morning she completely forgets her chores and goes straight to the clearing before anything else. Hell, she gets there just to stop on the edge because coming out of the cave is the gnarled, bent, black shrouded old witch. Now she's carrying a basket and this basket is filled with the yellow flowers of the clearing but suddenly not just beautiful yellow flowers Suddenly, they remind Irini of the color of sulfur. <sighs> she emboldens herself and steals herself and waits and hides in the shadows until the crone is well and gone. But it was quite a good thing that she had, because now the cave entrance was not empty. Instead, it was a great black one might describe this beast as a wolf I well if someone had never quite seen a wolf before imagine a rather shaggy matted black canine thing only with stunted ears and instead of just one set of eyes. Oh, and oh, it had a second set. That when the one was closed, the other was open. It was always watching. Great, terrible fangs. Horrible, wicked looking paws. Irene was, of course, scared. So she did the only thing she knew to do from growing up and spending so much time in the woods. She, she took her little hunting bow and she took an arrow, and she knocked it and she was ready to go. So closing her eyes, she let the arrow fly to no sound. When she opened her eyes again, it, it was not the clearing that she saw. It was her front doorstep. She was at her threshold to her home. So she took her bow as if to put it back on her back. And as she did so, she felt something unusual. Instead of fletchings, she pulled an arrow. As she did, she realized it was no longer an arrow. It was one of the yellow flowers. And in that moment, she knew the witch knew. And so she took off all her gear and threw it, threw it on her doorstep and she ran to the nearest temple. First, a small shrine to the goddess of the hunt, Artemis, where she fell and she prayed and she prayed to the maiden goddess that perhaps her, her shot had run true and that the witch would not be able to find her and that she could cover her tracks. Oh, and as she cried, she went on to the small temple to Hera down the road, and she fell again at the altar of the mother goddess. And she prayed that if she were to ever become a mother, if she were to be wed, let this be it. Please, goddess, stay with her. And finally, still in tears and still in shock, she went all the way down, all the way into the village, to the great and beautiful temple to Aphrodite. And there she fell, her tears finally drying. And at the altar, she prayed once more. 
that if this were love, if this were indeed true love, that the great goddess of love, oh, the Cyprian goddess would help her. It was all she could do. So she went back home, making it just as the sun was setting. She finished no, finished no chores that night. She finished no dinner that night. Instead went to bed, her eyes well and spent. And as she fell asleep, she dreamed. You see, the goddesses came to her and in this dream, they assured her it would go as planned. All was going according to plan. She just needed to return one more time, just one more time. She would need to carry her knife, and perhaps a bow, a little else. They asked her to make a sacrifice in their name, and they knew, they knew that she would understand. Um, at me and said, <laughs> Irene did not get to see the outcome because, of course, whether it's through dreams or, or birds or the tea leaves, the gods do not reveal all to mortals. Never have and never will. <laughs> At least not since Cassandra. And so Irene woke up before even the first cock's crow that morning. She set off. She had her bow, she had her knife, she had no arrows. But then as she got just into the woods, she realised something. They had said something about a sacrifice to her. She had no great bull to sacrifice or no wool to her name, nor anything of, of great value. So maybe one thing. You see, Something that she had kept on her person since she was a wee bairn. These little stones that her father had brought back when he was a tradesman and he would sail to the other Greek isles. He brought her back a little, little red stone and a little white stone and a little black stone with little silver bits and she'd kept them with her. And the thing about sacrifices so they don't have to be a lot. They just have to mean a lot, especially to the person making the sacrifice. Well, if anything meant a lot to her, this was it. And so she found a great, rare, beautiful oak tree, and she set the three stones at its base, and she hoped it would be enough. She continued on wait at the edge of the clearing. Well, when she arrived, she realized right there was her arrow, fallen exactly in the spot she had fired it from the previous day. And so she took it up and she waited. Well, sure enough, not too much further after the sun had risen, an old crone begins to make her way out into the clearing again, carrying her basket. Irene's ready this time. She has her bow and she draws it. Only she opens her eyes this time. She knows that she must keep her eyes open. It's the best way to honor the goddess of the hunt. So indeed she's ready. She takes a steady in breath and it rings true. The old crone lets out a wicked scream. <sighs> and turns to dust. Unfortunately, the arrow turned to dust too. So now, all Irini has is a little hunting knife to take on a great shaggy beast. Well, she has herself ready. She steals herself and she does her best. She's not really been trained for this, but right as the beast lunges for her, she sabs for it. But 
what she misses. Well, save for a few tiny hairs on the back of the beast's leg. I see. When Hera enchants something, it's not just to make it sharper or perhaps more deadly. No, see, in this instance, she had given this little hunting knife the ability to dispel magic, specifically evil magics. And so, this wee hunting knife cutting through just three hairs on the back of the beast's leg. Well, that was enough. That was enough to end the spell. So instead of the great maw of the beast closing around her, she felt the hands of Beaton taking her by the shoulders and holding her tight. For he had been the beast transformed two embraced, thinking that they would never have seen each other again, but sure enough, there they were. They made their way back, all the way back to her home. And there she helped him to be clothed, and, and he pulled her father away. He said to her father, My dear sir, I just want one thing. I would ask for your daughter's hand in marriage. Um, her parents didn't know anything about this boy except that, well, i am he's very clearly a pauper and a musician, which are two things that, you know, every parent wants for their daughter. But they saw the way that he looked at her, and the way that she looked at him, and, well, they had married for love. Why should their daughter not be afforded the same the same chance. And sure enough, Beaton left that day with a promise he would return the next morn. And sure enough, he did. <laughs> Beaton returned upon a great steed, for you see, he was not just some pauper musician. He was actually the prince, prince of the whole island, and he was going to t take Irene and make her his queen. Um, the two rode off into the sunset, if you will, and as a gift to his bride, at the place where she set her three stones, he built up the most beautiful shrine, black and white and red stone, a shrine for Hera and for Artemis and for, of course, beloved Aphrodite, just as a thank you for their machinations to bring them together so that uh, indeed they could just this once have a happily ever after. I do hope you all have a few happily ever afters. Enveloped the two of them almost in a growling rasping racket. At this point, Beton, a panicked look on his face, pushes Irene out and he says, go, you must go now. Now, Irene doesn't like being told what to do, but she knows by the tone of his voice that something is wrong. It is very wrong. So she runs all the way home. She's not certain what has happened, but she knows that she has to get home and she has to be safe. And so that night she prays again and she prays she thanks Hera for her help and hopes that she continues to help. The very next morning, she completely forgets her chores and goes straight to the clearing before.